Hi, everyone. <laughs> it's good to, to be back. Um, good morning and welcome to all. I'm Julio Capo, Jr. and I'm Deputy Director of the Wilsonian Public Humanities Lab here at FIU. Um, today, we at the WPHL wrap up season two of our Coffee and Conversation series dedicated to learning more about museums and histories of anti-Blackness. Uh, we began this project at the start of the coronavirus pandemic and quarantine, which now seems an eternity ago, uh, in order to understand and to better understand that is how cultural institutions were handling the changes before us at the time. The pandemic, however, um, is not at all isolated, but rather as we continue to see calls against anti-Black violence, we acknowledge that the overlapping pandemics of today are deeply rooted in the past. With this very much in mind, we're emphasizing the significance of centering Black lives and experiences in museums and cultural institutions, not just today, but always. And we're here trying to learn more about how practitioners um, in the field are working against the powers that have historically sought to erase, to marginalize, and to whitewash Black histories and experiences. Today, I have the great honor and pleasure to be in conversation uh, with Patricia Zeiler, Executive Director of the Fort Lauderdale Historical Society. Thank you so much for being here, Patricia. We're so lucky to have you. It's great to join you, Julio. Thank you. Before we, before we get going, and I'm so excited, um, let me sum up our format for those who are joining us. Uh, we'll talk for about 20 minutes and then we'll take questions from the audience and uh, for the remaining 10 minutes at the end. So at any time, just kind of, you know, submit your question for our guests using the Q&A chat button and I'll facilitate that conversation for Patricia. Um, so welcome again, Patricia. First, <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> we're all so polite, I love it. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the history of Fort Lauderdale and the Fort Lauderdale Historical Society, even the relationship between the two? Sure, of course. So uh, I'm going to just preface the, um, uh, my comments to, just to acknowledge that many of us today are joining this gathering from traditional lands of the Tequesta Seminole and Miccosukee peoples, and we take this moment to pay respect to their elders past and present. Thank you for that. We recognize the ongoing contributions of the First Nation people to the life of this region. Um, it's, it was Indigenous Peoples Day this past Monday, and today, happy National Archaeology Day, everybody. So we're a museum that offers um, uh, history and archaeology exhibits, so archaeology is a really important piece to us, so, um, uh, and, a, and a great window into the past. Uh, so we are, as Fort Lauderdale Historical Society operates three museums. A, a full history museum, a pioneer house museum, and a, a, a historic, uh, a, a replica 1899 schoolhouse. Those are our three public buildings for tour. And then we operate a full research library. Our collections are very extensive, um, 400,000 historic photos, 5,000 historic um, architectural sets of blueprints, 2,500 historic maps going all the way back to the 1500s. So, um, you know, archiving and collecting and library stuff is a big piece of our work. We also have, which is a, a, a very frequently used piece in our research library, um, newspaper clippings files that go all the way back to 1910, and I'm always a little nervous telling younger folks that we still update it every day. So it's still being added to and clipped into every day. So um, History Fort Lauderdale, we rebranded as to be a little more contemporary like History Miami. So um, that's kind of the work that we do. Um, the cool things we do in the research library that, that um, I mean, we never do the same thing twice. I'm working very often on historic preservation research um, had a really great opportunity to work and promote uh, the uh, preservation of a very important archaeological um, site along the New River this year. Very proud to say that our city has pur is purchasing that land under a, a, a city bond issue, and it is the largest and most important archaeological feature left on the entire New River. And um, Bob Carr of the Miami Circle likens it to our Miami Circle. So really proud to see that you know the, our work there also is um, uh, preserving that piece of the indigenous peoples who lived along the New River long before any of us were here. That's incredible, Patricia. Thank you so much for sharing that. And congratulations on all the incredible work you all are doing. Thanks. So necessary. Um, my next question is about coronavirus. Um, you, how have things at, at History Fort Lauderdale changed since the shutdown in March? And 
how can our audiences best support you and the work you all are doing, um, you know, in this time of uncertainty for, for, you know, all cultural institutions? So, um, you know, obviously we were closed for some time. Um, our friends at History in Miami are reopening this Friday. That's great news. Uh, we reopened in the middle of June. We're a smaller institution. Um, uh, a good, a wonderful piece of uh, uh, a boon to us was that our career source uh, Broward um, received funding for us to um, apply for grant funded positions for coronavirus and COVID related positions. So I think, I believe we have two of those folks right now because obviously we had to institute significant changes. We have the temperature taking, we have to be trained, all of our folks are trained on the um, questionnaire that we need to ask people. Masks are required. We had to install the plexis at the, at, the, at the desks and all of the safety, you know, safety procedures for our folks, as well as safety procedures for all the folks who come to visit us. So that was, I'm not gonna say that wasn't a challenge. The other piece that I think all museums are struggling with, um, and we've been on lo loads of calls over this last six months, our hands-on opportunities have been sort of tight tabled for now. So obviously before you know we reopened, we took all hands on things and removed them from exhibits, bagged and tagged them and put them in storage. You know, I don't know that they're ever returning. So you know we're we are actually putting in um, an on sale program, which is on sale is changing to story. Um, that's the 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 company name, but um, with the opportunity to have people have a digital experience of the museum on their own personal devices. No, no headphones, no earphones, no, you know, I think it's a better way to go. I mean, I, I, I really like the touch screens and the more uh, contemporary features that museums had been um, installing. But right now I, I see it as a real problem for us with visitors and, you know, the inability to keep that really safe and clean, you know, with multi multiple people visiting. So that was a, a piece of work for us to consider. And the other thing is, you know, how are we going to tell this story and collect the information that was and the experiences of people um, throughout the pandemic so that we can relate you know the you know whoever follows me in or you know 20 or 40 years from now the story is still here in um, uh, a, a place where you can it, when the next generation discovers, you know, hopefully there's nev this never happens again, but um, uh, it just discovers what happened in South Florida in 2020. So that's, that's nice. been sort of our big challenge with it. And um, um, it's been, we obviously, just like you guys, have had folks furloughed. Uh, we had 10 grant funded positions that are still furloughed. I'm hoping they come back on the first of November. They are largely folks who assist us in. Um, uh, there's several of those who are um, helping us with maintenance and facilities and several of those who are very high level researchers that are, you know, sort of a, a loss to us on our research library for research requests. So hopefully once those folks are back, our ability to answer research requests will be a little faster. So this, I mean, there's overarching, I, and I think, um, you know, for, for all of us in museums that uh, it's the loss of um, um, visitors who don't feel comfortable coming to an indoor building yet and what is our digital content look like and what are we we know what is our audience looking for so we're doing a lot of outreach to uh, members and other uh, institutional partners to you know what are you looking for you know as content you know and I and, and uh, you know as as an older person I you know I can, I can listen to a 30 minute video of somebody talking, but you know, that's not really how contemporary people learn. So we're just, you know, doing these quick vignettes, two minutes and, you know, doing two and three of those so that people get a flavor of what's going on and new um, issues that are being, uh, that sort of rise in the community as far as the, the subject matter that we deal with. That's so, that's incredible. And there's so many, so many things there. I, I'm so, uh, just to kind of clarify for, for our audience then, that you are then open, is it by appointment only at the moment or no? No, I mean, we do. We have an online ticketing system, okay. which we prefer, but we are still taking uh, uh, walk-in people. The thing that shocked me, Julio, I'll be very honest with you, is you know we all before we reopened, lots of national calls and meetings, expect a drive market, you're, you're 
customer, you're only going to see local customers. We've had customers from Russia. I mean, I just, you know, but, but I will very honestly tell you, we are down probably at 30% of pre COVID visitation. Wow. Uh, but we did bring on a team to handle our digital content and that skyrocketed. So that's, that's people are still visiting us, but you know, that as far as monetizing that. And I think the one thing I, you know, I, I was so th grateful that you included, like what do people need to do? So our audience today, pick an institution that's your friend that you think does really fine work and, you know, share their uh, social media posts, uh, respond to them, maybe give them some good reviews on Yelp and some of the other um, uh, platforms that are out there. Anything that can help bring that museum to uh, new folks through the social media channels would be, I know it would be incredibly helpful for us. I think most of my, uh, my colleagues would agree. <laughs> that's, that's a real need for us today. That's right. And I mean, to, much, to the extent that we can all do this, it's so, you know, it's such an easy way to support each other. And also, they can visit your website, correct, and the social right. media to, to offer contributions in any way that they can. And, and just to find about upcoming events and programming, mm -hmm. you know, and the digital work that's, that's going on. Thank you for that, Patricia. I really am excited to ask you questions about this incredible op-ed you wrote in the Sun Sentinel this summer. Uh, and it was titled, History Fort Lauderdale vows to do its part to fight racism. Uh, again, I encourage everyone to read it. Uh, I just, I, I wanna read a very small part of it about a sentence or two. As a community of human beings, Patricia wrote, it is time we develop a vaccine to end the epidemic of racism that has plagued our country since its inception. Our museums, research library and staff pledge to continue to uncover our own biases and contributions to the current state of inequity. We must listen and learn how to create safe and constructive spaces for sharing histories of the diverse communities that built and continue to shape Broward County, including indigenous ancestors who developed and protected this land for millennia. That's, that's from Patricia's uh, op-ed in the Sun Sentinel. So as we discuss these twinning pandemics, anti-black violence and structural inequalities that have um, as of late taken shape you know, distinct form through coronavirus, but of course have so many other manifestations. Uh, that's just one of them, right? What role do you see for cultural institutions like your institution, of course, uh, in the fight for black liberation and social justice? Um, here's a story of Broward County that I find, I, I tell people very often. Um, 1895, Henry Flagler decided to extend his railroad to Miami. He sent 400 African-American workers to Broward County, what is today Broward County, of course, back then it was Dade County, um, to complete the rail bed from Pompano Beach to the New River, which they did in the most amazingly short amount of time. And it's the, it's the rail bed, it's right outside our front door that runs there today. It's the FEC railroad tracks that runs through Broward County today. I don't know if you just heard it, but it just ran through my house. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it'll be here in a minute. Uh, so. Uh, 400 African American, of those 400, several, you know, several of them, you know, several hundred of them. At, so at that time, the area along the New River was predominantly, I mean, it's, there were only like about 70 other people here. So it was an African American settlement. It was not, not a white American settlement. A lot of those folks stayed to build the little fledgling town, a little, you know, the, the buildings that surrounded the train station, they, they stayed and, were, and worked and found employment. In the 1900 census, those people were not counted. The people of color were not counted. I, I think those stories um, are important to still relate today because just like Miami, just like a lot of Florida, our communities are constantly changing. We're having people visit us from the North. We're having people um, who, who may perhaps from other countries who have not experienced the racial segregation in the Jim Crow South laws that the African-American pioneers of South Florida struggled against. And, you know, there was no champion for them for many, many years. I mean, in Broward County, we had sundown laws, which were very prevalent across the Jim Crow South. An African-American person, those same FEC railroad tracks, could not cross east of them after sundown without a permit. To, 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 and of course, a lot of those folks were working in hotels, restaurants, 
um, doing, you know, day labor and work in people's homes as domestics. Well, of course they were working past sundown. So, you know, but it's the whole idea was, you know, was, was a person, a white person required to have this to pass into their neighborhood? I mean, it's just, you know, I think the idea that you know, understanding these stories gives us a real good perspective on some of the, um, the division that still lives today. And, and a sensitivity to it is very important for us when we come to the table and try to discuss the issues that are prevalent today. You know, that, that's, I, I just, I, it, it strikes me just as a mom, just as a human being, you know, I, 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 it, it's, it, it's something that I think um, I'd like to say is better, but I know I, I, I watch it and I, you know, our, our experts that consult with us, we have a very strong relationship with the old Dillard Foundation. Um, it's a, that's a, a largely African American uh, Broward County Historical Agency that uh, their, their museum was the old Dillard Museum, which has now been absorbed in the Broward County School. So it's not as public a building as it used to be. Um, you know, so we're working with them on an African American exhibit here so that we have a real good story telling of the African American pioneer experience in Broward County. And we have wonderful experts here on our staff, but I feel like we need to have really significant members of that community involved in telling the story as well. That's pow so powerful to hear. Thank you so much, Patricia. And, you know, to, as, as you noted, too, it's, it's um, you know, so much of the past uh, is, is very much in the present, right? The, the shaping of our urban landscape, the inequity that, that you know, uh, has its roots in, in the histories you just told us, very much still often look that way. Um, you know, that, that there's kind of remnants of it through uh, unequal housing, unequal access to education and healthcare. Um, the structuring of this, of course, remains in such powerful uh, and, and really, really, uh, uh, trans, you know, such, such pervasive ways. Um, thank you for, for the work you all are doing. Um, you know, in that op-ed, this is, this is harder to talk, you know, this is very difficult to talk about. In the op-ed you wrote in the Sun Sentinel, you also write about the, the very difficult uh, story and the very violent story of a, of a man named Reuben Stacy, uh, whose name has, uh, right, kind of often been forgotten, um, as, as so, you know, or not been told in the same way. I wonder if you can tell us a bit more about him and his tragic death uh, as lynching and the importance that we tell the importance of telling his story um, and that of so many other black women and men like him. Yeah, um, Reuben Stacy, uh, folks in Broward County like to refer to as the last lynching victim in Broward County. This is 1935. So this is not, you know, Civil War times. This is not, this is 1935. So, um, uh, there's a number of research, there, folks, folks, folks researching this right now. The really, um, wonderful thing I think is that our mayor, uh, Dale Holness of Broward County, uh, did a proclamation on the anniversary date in July of Reuben Stacy's death. And um, ten, at least 10 members of his extended family were present for that proclamation, right on Sistrunk in the, in the heart of the Northwest community. Um, you know, I, 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 think, I think the story itself tells a lot about the town in 1935, and it's it's not a good story, and some people find it uh, very offensive. And uh, I just think I think it needs to be told simply because some of those folks are still alive. You know, so here's exactly what happened. Reuben was arrested. Um, there's some controversy about you know the reason he was ar arrested. Um, uh, there's some new research coming out. I don't want to. Um, um, jump ahead, it's one of our uh, uh, researchers from the old Dillard Foundation and I don't wanna um, steal her glory, so she'll be publishing very soon. But what happened was he was arrested and then um, somehow the sheriff's deputy, who was the sheriff's brother, delivered him into the hands of a white mob. And I guess my thinking was always Ku Klux Klan, you know, which the, I remember the Klan here in Broward County in the 1980s when I moved to Davie. I mean, they were still, they were marching in Davie, the town of Davie, in their like Memorial Day parade, which I thought, I found very strange in, in those years. But so it was not though Klan, it was really a very kind of, white community outrage that, that, that um, they, they, they lynched this young man. Um, they didn't just lynch him, they desecrated his body, filling it full of buckshot. And then 
white families brought their children and took photographs with that, with that horrific. Here's, here's the thing that really struck me. Reuben today is enshrined in the Museum of Peace and Justice, the, the lynching museum in Montgomery, Alabama, which um, memorializes all of those martyrs killed in lynchings throughout the United States, particularly in the South, um, up until, you know, when, that, when finally federal legislation clamped down on those Jim Crow South practices. So we did uh, a jar collection ceremony. So the, the museum in Montgomery has the, the large plaques that hang from the ceiling representing each county in the South and the, inscribed with the names of the people from that county who were lynched. And it also has a jar wall with, you, with collection of uh, soil, either from the lynching site or the burial site. So we went with then commissioner, uh, Barbara Sharif, January, not of 20, but tw uh, 19, and did the jar collection ceremony at the cemetery where Reuben had been buried. And I said then to Barbara, as I say to you, you know, I think that of course, Reuben's family is still here. And of course, we know the lynching and the desecration of his body was not just a punishment for him, but for a, 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 an intimidation and, and um, of, of the entire African American community. So um, I, I, I'm just struck by the idea that, you know, would I have brought my child to that site to see that? You know, so Reuben's uh, soil is in, uh, enshrined in um, Alabama. And I was so struck by the director of that museum when it first opened, he did a great interview with Oprah Winfrey. And he basically said that he feels that the roots of today's and racial, uh, racial uh, attentions, some of them are from those lynchings simply because, and he, he was so empathetic and I thought, why don't I hear this from, from uh, a non-African American person? Mm -hmm. Because he said, what about those white children whose, fam whose parents, par parents who they look to as a, a, you know, a, 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 you know, someone they looked up to, that there was their guide and their, you know, their sort of tutor in many ways, brought them to this ho horrific place and took a picture of them with this, I just, you know, it boggles the mind. And I, I, I when I was new to here, and, and uh, I'm, an, I'm a nonprofit generalist. I'm not a historical person by, uh, by training. Um, I thought it was just here. Well, then I, I listened to the interview and it was done across the South. And you figure that was a common practice across all of the states south of the Mason-Dixon line where lynchings were occurring and white families were bringing their children to take pictures in these. It just, it, I, I mean, it, it, I don't have the words to describe how, I mean, how it, it um, how gruesome this is. I mean, it's just, I, I can't, would I, would I have brought my children? I'd like to believe I would not have, you know, but you live in a different time. Uh, the thing that uh, we, we helped and consulted on an article for Sun Sentinel about the Reuben Stacy lynching. And I, I was so gratified because I posted this on LinkedIn and a lot of our, my colleagues chimed in. Uh, one person posted to me that, what was I doing? I was inciting riots today in Fort Lauderdale because I was posting this, this in our, on our, our social media. And what I didn't, I didn't rant. I just deleted their comment or hid their comment. But on all I did in LinkedIn was say, you know, here's, here's what I think that I wanted to say, how would you feel if that was your son or your brother or your uncle or someone from your family, and this had happened to them. I mean, is there, you just have to put yourself there. And I kind of wanted to close this comment because I thought about this last night, you know, silly, you know, this little movie, um, uh, You've Got Mail. I don't know if you're, you're too young to remember it, but she, yeah, he says to, she says to him when she finally realizes that he's put her out of business and he says, it's not personal. And her response, and I, I wrote it down just so I would get it. Whatever else anything is, it ought to be to begin by being personal. And I thought that quote for me is kind of where I feel we all need to try to get ourselves in understanding these inequities that were practiced by our governments, by our municipalities, 
we weren't necessarily responsible or here for it, but it colors the lives of the people who were affected by it still today. And until we understand that and can speak from that point of view, we're not moving the, we're not moving the discussion forward. Right. What can liberation look like with that? You know, one, th thank you for that, Patricia. There, there, um, one of the things that I immediately got out of that is, is today, as then, as the history you told us, right? Today, it's the same thing, right? Not all white supremacists, including, and that no doubt includes those who tolerate or, or you know, condone white supremacy, wear hoods. I mean, that this is, this is um, and we can, the remnants of this are very much felt and, 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 and with us today, you know, the lynchings of, of Breonna Taylor, of South Florida's Trayvon Martin, um, no doubt that this is a, thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, and and uh, I'm thinking about all the good work that's being done locally uh, in, in this way to the uh, our friends at the African American Library and ARLAC, uh, African uh, African American Library Research. Uh, oh my goodness, African American uh, Library, Library Cultural, Center. Center. Cultural Center. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, suddenly, I'm. The, the incredible work that's being done locally. Um, yeah, that's a great institution. And I, I, you know, I just, I hesitate to bring this up, but it, it, in my mind, the continuation of this conversation is the, is the September 22nd executive order that bans certain languages that, you know, I think, um, you know, this is why the conversations are so critical to continue and recognizing the inequity. I mean, you know, Lonnie Bunch gave a great, uh, uh, interview this past Sunday morning on CBS Sunday morning uh, about, you know, there was this monuments, the whole monuments discussion that's still ongoing, you know, should Christo cause, uh, they took it from the perspective because it was Columbus Day coming the next day. And, you know, there's very mixed feelings about Columbus Day. They were very um, fair in their treatment because I do actually remember um, um, after, um, Italian Americans being discriminated against as a kid when I was, you know, when I, I lived in Pittsburgh, and that whole in that there they sort of latched on to Christopher Columbus as this hero of that everybody thought, you know, well he was Italian too, so see we're we're okay, you know, so you know I. I and, and, and Lonnie was really great in his treatment of that saying, you know, this is that it, but it is a continuing discussion. And, and the thing I really liked, he said, he said, I'm a historian. Anytime anybody's talking about history, I am happy. So it was, you know, he's just such a, um, such a down to earth, amazing leader in the museum world today. And we're so lucky to have him. And I was really pleased at the treatment that CBS gave the, gave the, the, um, uh, the, the whole the whole story and the idea of bringing let's identify heroes that are from all of these diverse communities and let's look at the statues that were you know that are that are planted today and say well what's missing so I they, they ended up with this um, the 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 statue the brand new statue in um, Philadelphia of the um, uh, um, post-Civil War activist and actually martyr for Black voting. Um, his name's Cato, C-A-T-T-O, and a brand new statue of him has just been installed outside City Hall in Philadelphia. And they had this African-American gentleman with his granddaughter being interviewed and in this, and he said, you know, what do you feel when you look at this statue? And he said, well, I'm, I, I, I stand up a little taller, and, you, know, you know, and this is, this, I'm, this, I'm proud. And he said to his daughter, granddaughter, this is a hero. We're gonna go home and learn more about him. And I was just like, yeah, this is, this is, this is it. This is what we want to have across all of the boards. And then I do think we really need to look at, I mean, one of the things that I, 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 I personally advocated for when I first came to work here was uh, there was that wasn't the petition was out to remove Andrew Jackson from the $20 bill and, you know, the whole persecution of the First Nation people that he perpetrated and, you know, the gruesome things that, he did and you know that's and that's one of the things too in south florida we really have to be sensitive to because the seminal story is a very is an extension of that story too so that's you know um another discussion locally that well probably every place with first nation people but particularly here because the really 
an interesting part of our history is that F Florida understand Spanish rule was a real refuge for both persons of color, slavery, and um, First Nation people because the Spanish law recognized those people as full, had full sets of rights, where uh, the English law, it was chattel and you know uh, wh whatever you were but you you could be owned and spanish law was different and that's why florida was such a refuge mm -hmm. up until the exchange of you know 1821 when florida became a uh, united states territory but when it was a spanish territory it really was a place of refuge for persons of color that i don't you don't hear that story that much but it's a really important part of the florida story this is, there's so, I mean, there's, there's, I, I love how grounded in, in the history you are here bringing us back uh, decades and centuries in this case of, and seeing the continuities of this, whether it's the Black Seminoles or whether it's these, aside, you know, even Florida as a site of refuge is such a clear, you know, we can see the parallels to today, whether that's immigration, how do we not talk about detention and these, the parallels to these stories are, are really important. I have been a terrible host insofar as that I have let us go over time without allowing me to say this is my fault and i i just want to say our director rebecca friedman said thank you so much for joining us and sharing the incredibly important work that you're doing um she has a question which i'm going to forward to you and you can respond to her because I, I we're so good at being on time um and and then she said what a wonderful way to end the season patricia oh, thank so thank you um so did the, several others have noted this in the chat. It seems like um, I'm trying to do three things at, at once. Um, I'm gonna, uh, I just let me, th th so thank you so much for, for joining us uh, and for the audience for listening and participating. Uh, Patricia, if it's okay, if they have additional questions, can they email you? Is that an okay? Absolutely, yes. Um, and if not, you can feel free to email me at jcapo um, at fiu.edu and I'm happy to forward them to, uh, to Patricia. Uh, I'm really excited to announce that the third season of Coffee and Conversations will begin October 20th. So in just a few days from one to another, um, we'll be slightly, it'll be a slightly different format. We partnered with Miami Book Fair and we'll be in conversation with a number of acclaimed writers and thinkers in this digital format that is the, you know, a, a product of where we all find ourselves in these days. We're all really excited about this and we'll hope you join us uh, for more information on that. Uh, please check our website at wphl.fiu.edu. Uh, Patricia Zeiler, thank you so very much for your time, your insight, and the incredible work you're doing uh, to, to, to bring these histories to, to life and back into uh, public attention, that these are difficult histories to tell often, but absolutely necessary and more critical than ever. Thank you for the work you do. Thanks for having me. Take care. And thanks to everyone.